in terms of actual job performance, you have to separate it into a few categories. Uh, in terms of actual performance in foreign policy, I think Trump's foreign policy record is significantly better than Biden's, the world being on fire right now, being a fairly good example of that. Uh, and we can get into each aspect of the world being on fire and where the incentive structures came from and how all of that happened in a moment. When it comes to the economy, I think that Trump's economic record was better than Biden's. Doesn't mean he didn't overspend. He did. He wildly overspent. Uh, but he also had a very solid record of job creation. A huge percentage of the gains in the economy went to people on the lower end of the economic spectrum. Actually, uh, the gross income to the average American was about $6,000 during his term. The unemployment rates were very, very low before COVID. You know, I think that you almost have to separate the Trump administration into sort of before COVID and during COVID, because COVID obviously is a sort of a black swan event, the, the most signal change in, in politics in our lifetime. Uh, and so you know, governance during COVID is almost its own category, which we can discuss. Um, but, you know, in terms of foreign policy, in terms of domestic policy, I think that Trump was significantly better uh, than, than Biden has been. And that's on the upside for Trump. On the downside for Biden, obviously, you're talking 40 year highs in inflation. You're talking about savings being eaten away. You're talking about everything being 20 to 30, 30 percent more expensive. Uh, you're talking about massive increases to the deficit, even at a rate that was unknown under Trump. Uh, the deficit under Trump raised by about a little under a trillion dollars every year up until 2020. Again, 2020 was COVID year. So everybody decided that we we're going to fire hose money at things. Um, but uh, then Joe Biden continued to fire hose money at things in 21, 22, and 23. Uh, you know, that obviously is, uh, in my opinion, bad economic policy. Uh, and then you get to the rhetoric and you get to the stuff that Donald Trump says. And as I've said before, my view is that on Donald Trump's epitaph, on his gravestone, it will say Donald Trump. He's had a lot of shit. Uh, I, I think that Donald Trump does say a lot of things. I think that that is basically baked into the cake, which is why everyone who's bewildered by the polls is ignoring human nature, which is at the beginning, when you see something very shocking, it's very shocking. And then if you see it over and over and over and over for years on end, it is no longer shocking. It is just part of the background noise like tinnitus. It just becomes you know something that your brain adjusts for. Uh, and so do I like a lot of Donald Trump's rhetoric? No, and I never have. Do I think that that is dispositive as to his presidency? No, I do not. Uh, when it comes to Biden, again, I think he's underperforming economically. I think that his foreign policy has been really a, a, a problem. Even the things I think he's done right are, I think, band-aids for things that he created by doing wrong. Uh, and when it comes to his, his own rhetoric, you can argue that it's grading on a curve because Trump was coming in with such wild rhetoric that just the maintenance of that wild rhetoric doesn't really change again the baseline. For Biden... He came in in the same way that Obama did on the sort of soaring rhetoric of American unity. I'm the president for all. Like Trump came in, he's like, listen, I'm the president for, for what I am. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to say the things I want to say. I'm beyond the toilet. And I'm tweeting. And we're like, OK, you know, so that's what it is. With Biden, he came in with I'm a president for all Americans. I'm trying to unify everybody. And that pretty quickly broke down into a lot of oppositional language about his political opponents in particular, an attempt to lump in, for example, huge swaths of the conservative movement with the people who participated, for example, in January 6th, or who were fans of January 6th. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the sort of lumping in of everybody into MAGA Republicans who wasn't personally signed on to a, an infrastructure bill with him. Uh, that, that sort of stuff, I think, has been truly terrible. I thought his Philadelphia speech was truly terrible. And again, I think that you do have the problem of he is no longer capable of certainly rhetorically unifying the country when Every speech from him feels like watching Nick Melinda walk across a volcano on a tightrope. And it, it really is like you're, you're just sort of waiting for him to fall. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's sad to say. I mean, the other day he was speaking for what was, in effect, his campaign kickoff. And this is in Valley Forge. Uh, and, I mean, Jill rushed up there, like, off the, off the, as soon as he was done, Jill rushed up there, uh, you know, like she'd been shot out of a cannon to, to come and try and guide him away so he didn't become the Shane Gillis Roomba. And, you know, that, that's not really, you know, uh, I, I, let's put it this way. It, it, it does not quiet the soul to watch Joe Biden rhetorically. Again, that's a different problem than, than Trump's problem, but th that's my analysis. Uh, this is one of the areas where we get into this. I don't understand um, if there's like brain breaking happening or what's going on. I don't know what world we can ever live in where we say that Trump is less divisive for the country than Biden. I think it is so patently obvious. Trump is so divisive. Like not only does Trump make an enemy out of every person in the opposition party, he makes an enemy out of his own party and every single person around him. Like we all watched him bully, uh, you know, Jeff Sessions. We all watched him bully his own party on Twitter. We all watched like all of these people walk away from him. Um, even recently, I think, um, 
his uh, the Secretary of Defense Esper and um, John Kelly, the Chief of Staff, were you know saying, I think Trump is a threat to democracy. Um, you know, you've got all of his prior people that were around him, some of his closest allies. You've got Bill Barr that won't co-sign a single thing that he says. Um, you've got all these people that he used to work with that all say Trump is a horrible, evil person. He is ineffective as a leader. He doesn't accomplish anything, and he didn't. You know, to say that Biden has failed at bipartisanship when you know we've gotten the Chips Act, we've gotten the IRA, we've gotten the uh, ARP, we've gotten the bipartisan infrastructure bill, when we've got like all this major legislation that is working in this historically divided Congress, as opposed to Trump that got us tax cuts and deficit spending. Um, I, I don't understand where we ever are in this world where Biden is somehow more divisive than Trump. Even the speeches that Ben is bringing up, I, they, they always bring up, I remember that one, um, I think we might have even done it on our episode, the, the one speech that Biden gave where at one point the, like, the background is red. Mm -hmm. and yeah, the Philly speech I like, referenced. Yeah. yeah, and they're like, oh my God, it's over, this is the end. And then meanwhile, you've got Donald Trump you know, coming into office saying things like, if you burn the flag, you should have your citizenship revoked. Or talking about MS uh, DNC, that I'm going to investigate every single one of these uh, media organizations for corruptness. I'm going to open the libel and defamation law and I'm going to take all of these guys to court. Um, you've got this weird Project 2025 stuff where um, is it John Paschal, I think, uh, is talking about, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to investigate all of these people and we're going to try to throw crimes at all these people. Uh, Trump is like the most divisive president I think we've ever had, in, in, at least in, in my lifetime of being um, an, an American citizen. And the rhetoric from him is just, it's on a whole other level in terms of the demonization of political opponents. I mean, this is a guy that's known for giving his political opponents bad nicknames, <laughs> right? Like, that's what Trump does. Um, you know, like, it, it's funny, but even as a resident of Florida, if Florida had another natural disaster, do you think Trump would withhold aid? Because you had, uh, I think that was one of the few nice things that DeSantis actually said about Biden was that like, hey, listen, you know, when the buildings collapsed in, I think that Surfside, was in yeah. Miami Beach, yeah, that, um, you know, for the hurricane stuff that Biden was there, he was saying, if you guys need aid, however many billions, you can have it. Meanwhile, Trump, I think, was threatening to withhold federal funding from blue states that wouldn't, um, I think it had to do with the National Guard stuff, the deployment of the National Guard, that they weren't like doing enough for the riots. And and uh, Trump was threatening to withhold aid from some of these blue states. Um yeah, Trump is literally the most divisive person in the world. I don't see how on any metric he is ever succeeding in the divisive category. In terms of the economy, I do think it's funny that Republicans are very keen to say that, like, well, we can't really grade Trump, you know, post-COVID because obviously COVID messed everything up, which is fair. But pre-COVID, what did Trump do? Yeah, he did, he did deficit spending tax cuts. He presided over historic low interest rates and an economy that was already like, like blazing past the final years of Obama. We were posting all time highs in all the stock markets in 2013 onwards. Um, you know, unemployment rates were falling. Now under Biden, unemployment rates are even lower than they were under Trump. But, uh, it, it sucks that for Trump, we can say, well, we can't really hold him accountable for 2020. That was COVID. Well, all we have for Biden is post COVID. We don't have any pre COVID Biden, uh, you know, economy. And it was the same thing for Obama too, coming in right after the housing collapses well. And it sucks that Republicans are able to walk out of office, you know, having burned the entire American society to the ground economically. And now we've got to try to evaluate, okay, well, what did Obama do during his first two to three to four years just trying to recover from where uh, the housing crash left it? And then we look at Biden now, who's trying to recover from COVID, and now we're grading him on a, on a totally different scale than what Trump is being graded on. Yeah, that that sucks, I think. Uh, we can go into on the foreign policy? On the foreign policy, <clears throat> I'm going to be honest, I am a, um, I am very liberal. I'm very not progressive. Uh, I'll probably come off as more hawkish than others uh, because I'm not a big fan of this, which also, if I mean, if Ben agrees, like I think uh, people like people like Trump are going to be the most dovish isolationist people ever. They don't want to do anything uh, internationally. They just want to, you know, protect America, be at home, protect our economy, don't do anything uh, internationally, which is why he was constantly undermining NATO uh, and constantly, you know, attacking all of the, the European Union and, you know, cheering on the UK for brexiting away from the EU. I think that being said, um, I think that Biden has done a phenomenal job uh, when it comes to foreign policy. I think that the coalition building was so important for Ukraine, Russia, and I'm so happy that he decided to go to our European allies and our NATO allies and try to build a coalition of people to help Ukraine so that that wasn't only the United States. Um, 
personally, especially after doing a whole bunch of research, I do tend to side with Israel over um, Palestine and a lot of the Israeli-Palestinian conflicts. I'm glad that Biden, while remaining a staunch defender of Israel, is trying to rein in some of the more aggressive posturing towards uh, the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. I'm, I'm proud that Biden said, hey, listen, we're going to delay some of these attacks. Hey, listen, we are going to allow humanitarian aid here. Hey, listen, we are going to try to, uh, you know, not kill as many Palestinian people down there while still, you know, signaling that he would be a staunch supporter of um, of Israel in, in the conflict, assuming the civilian casualties don't go too high. Um, for foreign policy, I mean, blemishes, I mean, the, the, the biggest one you can give to Biden is Afghanistan and the poll out there. But man, are we going to talk about, you know, the uh, inspector general report that says that one of the biggest reasons why the Afghanistan poll was so disastrous was because of the Doha Accords, where Donald Trump headed talks that didn't even include the Afghanistan army. Uh, I mean, like these were disasters. Like when, when Biden took office, we had 2,500 troops left in Afghanistan. Like what was the options even uh, afforded to Biden at that point? Um, obviously, you've got the abandonment of the Kurds in northern Syria to, you know, for the Turkish armies to lay waste to. Um, you're talking about Iran and North Korea, although I'm not sure where uh, Ben would land on those. But yeah, that's a broadly. Yeah, that's, that's a lot from both. Of you you, yeah. you want to pick, pick at something where you disagree with here? Well, I mean, th th there's a lot. So, mm -hmm. I mean, so I want to ask a few questions on each one of these. Yeah, sure. Uh, so let's let's talk about divisiveness mm -hmm. for a second. So I, there's no one who can make the case that Donald Trump is not divisive. Yeah. Of course, he's incredibly divisive. It's a given. Mm -hmm. Do you treat Biden's rhetoric with the same level of seriousness that you treat Trump's rhetoric? Or sh I should probably put that the other way around. Should we treat Trump's rhetoric with the same level of seriousness as Joe Biden or, say, Barack Obama's rhetoric? Um, I'm going to try to be concise when I say this. Broadly speaking, especially in studying Israel, Palestine, and Ukraine, Russia, I try not to take politicians at their word because sometimes they just say stuff to say stuff. I understand that. But broadly speaking, I'm going to look at the rhetoric and the actions, and I am going to grade them the same. So, yes, I would hold Biden and Trump to the same standard. Right. So, m my feeling is, and this is one area where, for clarification, we're going to have a division, mm -hmm. uh, is that. I, of course, don't treat Trump's rhetoric in the same way that I treat Biden's or Obama's. He's utterly uncalibrated, and he says whatever he wants to at any given time, and it doesn't even match up with his policy very often. Can uh, I ask you, like, for our head of state, our chief executive, shouldn't rhetoric be arguably one of the most important things that he does? I mean, like, the answer would be yes, and now I've been given a choice between a person who I think in calibrated ways says things that are divisive and a person who in uncalibrated ways says things that are divisive. And so the evidence that Joe Biden is divisive is every poll taken since essentially August of, of 2021. He he is, by all available metrics, incredibly divisive. A huge percentage of Americans are deeply unhappy, not only with his performance, but don't believe he's a uniter. They're, they're, that, that's just the reality. And that may just be a reflection. I mean, honestly, we may be putting too much on Trump or Biden personally. It may just mm -hmm. be that the American people themselves are rhetorically divided because of social media and social media can, in fact, be accessible. And, I would, and all one that. thing that I would ask you about that, though, sure. is I agree, especially when you look at the favorability. But sometimes w when I look at these polls, when you start to disaggregate them by party, I wonder if it's actually is Biden historically divisive or um, I'm trying to think of a really polite way to say this. The people that like Trump worship Trump. I don't know. I like one of the most prescient things that Trump could have probably ever said was that I could kill someone on Fifth Street and nobody would so, hold me accountable. So is it really that Biden is strictly divisive or is it that every single Trump supporter will always say that Trump is great? And no, I, the, 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 the reason I would say that, that Biden is, in fact, historically divisive is mm -hmm. because Republicans felt much more strongly about Barack Obama than, than Joe Biden, actually. But they didn't um, feel as strongly about Trump as they did about like Romney or McCain. Right. In in what way? I mean, and like, that, the allegiance to Trump. Oh, no, there's certainly more allegiance to Trump than there is to Romney or McCain, largely because Trump won in 2016. But beyond that, the the point that I'm making is that if you're looking at the stats in terms of divisiveness, mm -hmm. Republicans always find the Democratic president divisive. The question is where the rest of the country is. Mm -hmm. And right now, there are a lot of Democrats who either don't agree with Biden or, you know, find him divisive. There are a lot of independents who find him divisive. So when you're, when we're comparing these things, I don't think they're leagues apart in terms of the divisive effects of what they say. Do right. And, and, and I'm separating that off from like the inherent content of what they say. Cause obviously what Trump says is, is more divisive just on like the raw level. I mean, if he's insulting people as opposed to Joe Biden doing MAGA Republicans, like if I were to just, if I'm an alien come down from space and look at these two statements, I'd say this one's more divisive than this one. Mm -hmm. But then there's the reality of being a human being in the world. And that is everyone has baked Donald Trump into the cake. And Joe Biden, again, started off with a patina of being 
non-divisive and now has emerged as divisive. I, if you don't mind, I actually want to get to the, the foreign policy questions because this one is actually slightly less interesting to me. Sure. Yeah, well, I'm, can I yeah, answer, just, sure, yeah, just one quick thing, I guess, like, because we can say the reality of it and we can look at opinion polls. What if we look at like legislative accomplishments? Like Biden is working on a 50-50 divided Senate. Donald Trump had both House of Congress and the Supreme Court and got like no major legislation passed. Well, but, I mean, he, he, he did lose congress in 2018 but yeah, sure but, but prior to that because we got the uh, we got the infrastructure bill i think in one year which trump promised for his entire presidency didn't get anywhere well, on it. i mean yes his, his republican base was not in favor of mass spending on infrastructure and neither am i so th there's that i think that's sure. mostly a state and local but they issue. were in favor of mass spending for tax cuts that's not a spending i mean that we, i mean it, effectively it, it is right like effectively it's not well, if, if, if you're, if if you're if cutting you, tax receipts, but you're not changing the level of spending, like Biden did with the uh, IRA. I mean, uh, again, well, we, we, have a, we have a fundamental philosophical difference here. I think that when, you, when the government takes my money, mm -hmm. that, is not, that is not the government somehow being more fiscally responsible. And when the government allows me to keep my money, I don't see that as the government spending. I see that as my money and the government is taking less of it. That's great. But at the end of the day, the government is still going to be in a deficit spending and they're going to have to borrow money from the treasury. Right. We have a spending problem. In other yeah. words, not a receipts problem is the sure. case that I'm making. The, sure. the problem with, with Donald Trump is not that he lowered taxes. The United States has one of the most progressive tax systems on the planet. And in fact, if you wish to have a European style social welfare state, what you actually need is to tax the middle class to death. I mean, the, the reality <clears> is that the top 20% of the American population pays literally all net taxes in the United States after mm -hmm. after state benefits and all of this. Sure. So if, if you actually wanted to have the kind of social welfare state that many liberals seem to want to have, like Northern Europe, for example, mm -hmm. you'd actually have to tax people who make forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars sure. And I don't want that. Rate. I agree with that. So but how do you explain the lack of legislation? I mean, if he's like such a uniter. Because I think the Republican Party itself is, is quite divided. And I think that Trump's- But isn't that his job? He's the head of the Republican Party. He's the president, Republican president of the United States. I mean, again, I don't think that Joe Biden has passed wildly historic legislation the other than, bill was the largest like so here, here's yeah. the problem if you're a republican uh -huh. the only bills that you can get consensus on tend to be bills that either that that let's be real about this that are tax cuts mm -hmm. because as you would i think agree with mm -hmm. when it comes to polling data americans constantly say they want to cut the government and then the minute you ask them which program they have they no idea what they're, they're right exactly and so trying to add, it's much harder to come up with a bill to cut things than it is to come up with a bill to add things coming up which is why spending was out of control under under trump as well but there are some republicans who still don't want to spend on those things right so inherently the the task that this goes back to the first question the task that republicans think government is there to do is different than the task that democrats think that government is there to do. So the way that the, the very metric of success for a Democratic president versus a Republican president, namely, for example, pieces of legislation passed, as a Republican, one of my goals is to pass nearly no legislation because I don't actually want the government involved in more areas of, of our life. I want to ask a couple questions on the foreign policy. Sure. Front. Yeah. Okay. Wait, real, real quick. Just So for instance, like Donald Trump wanted to punish China and he wanted to bring a uh, microprocessor manufacturer to the United States. Uh, Biden did that with legislation, with the CHIPS Act. Uh, you talk about like spending being out of control. And I, I mean, I can agree with that. I think anybody that looks at the numbers has to agree with that. But why not pass legislation like the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which is at least like spending neutral, right? Like why are there not bills where Donald Trump could take- Well, I mean, I, first of all, I think that whenever the government says something is spending neutral, it rarely materializes that way. That is not going to be a spending neutral bill. Sure, but the there's a difference between like, at least they say it's spending neutral versus this is a $500 billion yeah. bill over like 10 years. I mean, right? I, I don't, well, but again, I don't see a tax cut as a matter of quote on spending neutrality. The big problem is they keep spending, not that they are allowing me to keep the money that I earned and they did not earn. But okay, so you know. then just to understand, so if somebody just did massive like reductions in tax receipts, so tax cut yes. after tax cut after tax cut, but they didn't change spending at all, you wouldn't consider that like an increase in deficit spending or out of control spending. You would just say they're just tax cuts. No, the opposite. I would, I would consider it a wild. I would, I would consider it a wild overspending. Okay. Meaning, meaning so then that, was it under Trump then when he did the tax? I mean, the, the deficit spending, by the way, under under Biden is way worse than it was under Of course, Trump. but we're in post-COVID, right? COVID ended effectively. I mean, you live in Florida. COVID effectively ended in the state of Florida by the middle of 2021. Yeah. I mean, even, well, if, you, even why, if you're a vaccine like the, fan, by like April, May of 2021, mm -hmm. there was wide availability of vaccines, whether or not you like the vaccines. Yeah. And at that point, we were done. I, I agree. Mean, but and, like we're in a post, like how many trillions of dollars have been dumped in worldwide that are like leading to inflation, right? The inflation is like a worldwide uh, issue right now because of the economy shutting down for a year or two. It's not like those effects are gone in one year, right? COVID might be gone, but the after effects of all the stimulus spending and the unemployment and everything the else. The definition of inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. So pouring more money on top of that makes for more inflation. That's what it does. Sure. I agree. Uh, 
agree. Um, but like, there's also the definition of when do you deficit spend is when economies are headed for recessions, right? Rather than when economies are doing really well, like they were under Trump and he was deficit spending. Whereas Biden can at least make the argument that I should, I ought to be deficit spending because the economy is heading for a potential so recession. The, the, right? So here's the thing. I don't think that the economy was actually headed for recession. In, in fact, if you look at the economic Every statistics. Every economist said that it was. Every no, it, okay. They're still it, it was, saying that there's like a recession coming, right? Right. So but like, that, that was largely because of the after effects of inflation, meaning if you inflate the economy, what you're going to end up doing is bursting a bubble. And then when that bubble bursts, you'll get a recession. I mean, that was the basic idea, right? The idea, the question was whether you're going to get a soft landing. But if you actually look at, for example, the employment statistics or the economic growth statistics in the United States, what they look like under the last year's Obama and then Trump, I mean, mm -hmm. this is what the chart looks like, is it looks like this. And then it hits March of 2020. It goes like that. Yeah. Right. And then by like September, it bounces back up, right? It's a V-shaped recovery. And then it starts to peter out. Sure. And a lot because of the American recovery plan, right? That Biden did as well. I mean, four million jobs. Yeah. No, I don't. I'm not going to attribute it to that because the, the rates of growth in in job growth from September, October, November were actually very similar to the rates of job growth after Joe Biden took office. What you see is actually kind of a, a straight line. I mean, what, what the chart looks like. Get, okay. in, in any case, okay. okay so yeah, sorry, uh, on the foreign policy stuff, yeah. this is yeah. getting abstruse. But in, on, the, <laughs> on, the, on the foreign policy stuff, um, so the the questions that I have mm -hmm. with regard to to Biden on foreign policy, uh, very. Very simple question. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the situation in the Middle East is better now than it was under Donald Trump? Mm, uh, probably. Um, that's a hard one. 